Good afternoon. I'm Nathaniel Ford, Chair of TRB's Executive Committee, and I also have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Executive Officer for the Jacksonville Transportation Authority in Jacksonville, Florida. It is my honor to convene the 2023 Annual Meeting of the Chair's Plenary Session. Due to limited seating in this room, this session is being multicast in session rooms throughout the Convention Center. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here in the ballroom and those of you who are listening to us and seeing us remotely. And this past year, I've had the pleasure of serving as the chair of TRB's executive committee, a year of opportunity for the country and for the world. Together, we continue to recover from the pandemic while also working to implement all of the solutions and goals related to the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is to rebuild America's roads, bridges, rails, buses, expand transportation options for all, tackle the climate crisis, and advance environmental justice. We are to create safer neighborhoods and invest in those communities that have been too far often left behind. Now there is an enormous amount of work that needs to be done, but I am very optimistic about the future because during the past year, I've had the great fortune to work, with, work very closely with many of you who are leading the efforts as it relates to the transportation community and the solutions that we need for years to come. Furthermore, I'm very confident that because of the great work all of you have done this past year, and I have to shout out to our TRB Minority Fellows, they are doing a fantastic job. I am confident and clearly our future is bright. It has been a change, a year of change and growth and success. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize Neil Peterson, whom this past December concluded his tenure as our TRB Executive Director. Thank you, Neil, for your hard work and your dedication to this organization and our industry. You accomplished what everyone hopes when entering into a position, and that is to leave it better than when you found it, and you definitely have done that, Neil. Please join me in a round of applause to recognize Neil Peterson. <clears throat> As many of you know, TRB was established in 1920, and on TRB's 102nd annual meeting, I have the honor of a lifetime to be the first chair to actually say, welcome, Madam Executive Director, Ms. Victoria Sheehan. <laughs> Victoria, you have my full support and admiration, as well as that of all of the TRB's thousands of volunteers. You will continue to grow as the value of TRB uh, grows and the tradition that we have in this transportation community of supporting each other and the people that we serve, your success will be our success. I'd like to thank also at this moment Jennifer Homendy, Chair of the National Transportation Safety Board, for agreeing to be to this afternoon's keynote speaker. And before we recognize TRB's award recipients and hear from Chair Homendy, I'm honored to welcome U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and Department of Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm to a fireside chat. The secretaries are joining us today to explore the administration's efforts to decarbonize the transportation sector and increase the, and explain the role of the DOT and Department of Energy Joint Office of Energy and Transportation in these efforts. Prior to joining the Biden and Harris administration, Secretary Buttigieg served two terms as the mayor of his hometown, South Bend, Indiana. A graduate of Harvard University and a Rhodes Scholar at, at Oxford, Secretary Buttigieg served for seven years as an officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve. Taking a leave of absence from that mayor's office, he went into deployment to Afghanistan in 2014. Now, Secretary Buttigieg has the monumental task of leading the U.S. Department of Transportation and their efforts to implement the Historic Infrastructure Investment and Job Act. Secretary Granholm, 
The Secretary of Energy served as the 47th Governor of Michigan from 2003 to 2011. Secretary Granholm is an honors graduate of both the University of California at Berkeley and the Harvard Law School. She is leading the Department of Energy's work to advance cutting edge clean energy technologies that will help America achieve President Biden's goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 while creating jobs and building an equitable economy. During today's fireside chat, I will be joined on stage by TRB Executive Vice Chair, Dr. Sean Wilson, who also serves as the Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Buttigieg and Secretary Granholm to the stage. Secretaries, welcome, and please know that TRB stands ready to help the administration in any way we can to provide transportation solutions that are reliable, sustainable, and equitable. The recent Blueprint for Transportation Decarbonization laid out a very ambitious goal to help all of our transportation modes, so we're ready to get started. President Biden has announced a 2030 goal of making half of all new vehicles in the United States zero emissions vehicles and to build a national electric vehicle charging network. Last year, the administration put out the first round of funding to help move towards these goals, and you saw plans come from all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, on how they'd like to use those funds and build out the backbone of this network. Tell us a bit about how this effort is going so far, and what does it mean for the people in the, in the parts of this country where maybe EVs aren't as popular or available? Well, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for having us. And just before getting to the question, I think I should probably say a word about the news of the day. Uh, it's been uh, another challenging day for U.S. aviation. There was a, a systems issue overnight that led to a, a ground stop. Uh, because of the way that uh, safety information was moving through the system. Uh, that was resolved, which allowed this, the ground stop to be lifted at 9 this morning, but through the day we're going to see the effects of that rippling through the system. Uh, we are now pivoting to focus on understanding the causes of the issue. Uh, and the main thing I want everybody to understand is that every step of the way, safety is going to be our North Star. Uh, as it always is. So I just wanted to make sure to take a moment to, to address that. Um, having said that, uh, and on the very exciting topic of the decarbonization of transportation, we feel that it is often in those very areas you mentioned that are not maybe automatically considered to be the prime candidates for EVs to roll out, where they may make the biggest difference in the coming years. And we're working to make sure we facilitate that. We're enthusiastic that, as you mentioned, 50 states and DC and Puerto Rico have submitted their plans, uh, were approved, and that's how they're going to use the formula dollars, by the way, in ways that are tailored to the needs of each state, which are very different. Uh, that is soon to be coupled with the $2.5 billion in community charging which is designed to reach places that are very different from what I would call the backbone of, of the national highway network that we're working to, uh, to get the chargers in through the formula funds that the states are spending. But finding those areas, some of which might be within blocks of where we're sitting, where it perhaps is not yet profitable or economical for a private sector entity to install a charger, a multifamily dwelling in a lower income neighborhood, but where we know that has to be available in order for people to take advantage of the savings that could come with having an EV. Meanwhile, you have a lot of rural areas, which again, because of how electric vehicles code, politically and culturally, might not be seen as obvious candidates for this work. We all know the 1.0 image of electric vehicle drivers, sipping the latte in the big city, 
on your way to get sushi or whatever people imagine about electric vehicles. But if you think about it, in rural areas, you have longer distances, which means better potential gas savings, and you have more people living in single-family homes, which means the opportunity to charge at home. Uh, so we really need to continue to have a strategy that, that fits all of these different geographies, meets them where they are, and makes the possibilities uh, clear. And we're so excited to be doing it in partnership with Secretary Granholm and the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation, which I think is unique in the history of both our agencies, certainly ours, uh, with just phenomenal cooperation with what we know about transportation and what DOE knows about energy, teaming up to get that done. Let me, I'll just add, um, number one, that this blueprint allows for this kind of cooperation across government, obviously the four agencies that are uh, involved and have developed this. Having one goal, all driving toward that goal and bringing to bear the equities of each of our offices is just really important. And we've got to make sure that we live up to it, that there are metrics, et cetera. But it all involves so much partnership with the folks across the country who are actually um, putting feet to our prayers or putting wheels to our prayers, uh, as we say. I think it's um, significant that uh, the effort with respect to charging electric vehicles, which of course the goal to get uh, to decarbonize the, uh, the uh, transportation system given that it provides 30% of our carbon pollution, but the, the effort very pragmatically that generally, and there may be some exceptions to this, but generally as you travel along one of these transportation corridors, which was the first phase of the rollout of the charging infrastructure, that you will have to, you will be able, if you have an electric vehicle, to access a charger within 50 miles, 50 miles apart, not more than one mile off the freeway, and again, tailored to each uh, community, each state's circumstances is, is very significant. But all of this is now being done in partnership and collaboration, and that's what the blueprint is all about. That's what this joint office is all about, and I'm very excited to work with such a, a tremendous partner in the federal government to make it happen. So um, staying in that vein, one, thank you for that example of collaboration between agencies, because within the states, we're doing the same thing, mirroring what we're seeing in that effort. You both have been tremendous champions for EVs. Uh, and rolling that out. What are some of the barriers that we're seeing uh, that still exist and what are you doing collectively and or individually as independent agencies to address some of those challenges? Who do you want to go? Ladies first. Okay. I'll take this, I'll take a piece of this first because I know you've got ideas about what are the barriers to. Of course, the big barrier which you kind of alluded to is cost, right? So the Department of Energy has been focused for years really on driving down the cost of the battery, which is the main cost of an electric vehicle. But the combination of the, the President's agenda, the Clean Energy Agenda and the Inflation Reduction Act and the specific incentives to have the demand side taken up by consumers where you get $7,500 off your vehicle at the dealership for American-made vehicles. That's significant. Now, some people say, and, and some people say, well, they're still too expensive, and we all want to continue, and we will continue to drive down the price of the vehicles through the technology, driving down the price of the battery. But uh, the automakers are now putting out vehicles that are affordable, too. So, for example, you know, I, uh, my personal vehicle is a Chevy uh, Bolt. Uh, I'm not advertising anything, but just in an example, um, some um, models, of, some versions of the Chevy Bolt start at $25,000. Manu manufacturers suggested retail price. You take $7,500 off of that. You're now financing potentially a $17,000 car. That's affordable for a lot of people, not everybody. But if you can't afford that, then there's $4,000 off in the Inflation Reduction Act for used electric vehicles. So. So that's the demand side, and then, and, and that's a barrier, right? And I just have to say one other thing, which is the supply side is being addressed as well, which means we want to make those vehicles in the United States so that more consumers can qualify for them and so that we put people to work. And so since the, I mean, the president has really been pushing hard on creating a manufacturing strategy, an industrial strategy around these clean energy, including transportation. And on the transportation side, just on the battery side, 
in the past two years, because of all of this push and this incentive and the grants, et cetera, that are coming through the Department of Energy, we have now had 75 battery companies announce they are opening shop in the United States. When I say battery companies, I'm talking about vehicle manufacturing uh, the batteries or manufacturing a piece of the supply chain, the anode, the cathode, the separator material, the electrolyte, or um, the critical minerals processing. Uh, all of these companies coming to the United States, whereas before we were relying on economic competitors, Asia, in Asia, China, et cetera, to, who, were, who had a strategic plan to bigfoot these sectors, and now it's coming to the United States because of policy. So policy really does make a difference. It makes a difference uh, for the climate. It makes a difference for communities on the ground. We're very excited about that. Well, amen to all of that. And uh, I think that that policy difference really speaks to the, the uh, recognition that some things won't happen on their own. The industry is going electric. I think that much has been established. It's true here and it's true around the world. You talk to the OEMs, uh, you, you talk to anybody who watches the industry, we see that happening. And so some might ask, well, if, if that's happening, wh why would you do any policy interventions at all? And that really is to address three things that are not going to happen on their own. Some of the things that Secretary Granholm was describing. Three questions I think we've got to make sure the answer turns out to be yes. One, will it happen fast enough to help us meet our climate imperatives? Two, will it happen in a made in America fashion? Because just because the EV revolution is coming doesn't mean it will be a made in America manufacturing revolution. And as a, a fellow child of the industrial Midwest, as a Hoosier by birth and, and Michigander by marriage, I have seen the implications for communities of the ups and downs of the auto industry. Policy helps make sure that this flourishes in America with American workers and American jobs in American communities. And then three, will this develop on equitable terms? Especially knowing that many of those who might stand to benefit the most from the savings that could come with EV ownership are also those who might face the steepest barrier in terms of that upfront cost. And that's why buying down that upfront cost, not just for new vehicles, but for used vehicles, as Secretary Granholm described, is so important. These policy interventions help make sure that this doesn't just happen, but it happens in the right way. And we're seeing that with the Inflation Reduction Act, with the infrastructure law. But we know that in addition to the upfront cost, the charging can be an issue. And that's why we're teaming up to address both of them. And the last thing I would mention here, and I'm looking out here at TRB, at this community of transportation experts, policymakers, uh, and business leaders, there is enormous opportunity here not just if you are with a major automobile manufacturing company, but smaller businesses that could, for example, be part of this process of, of, of building and selling and installing those chargers. And we are at work to make sure that there is a diverse business base ready to serve that need, which could be economically empowering for people in every part of the country. Hey, can I just jump in on one other thing on this question, which is on, on, on the barrier, the cost. If everybody knew that to charge your electric vehicle at home on average, to fill it up, if you will, your you know, 300 mile range or whatever it is, it costs about $12. Of course, to fill up a 15-gallon tank, it costs uh, about $49. So you're saving 35 plus dollars every time you fill up. So it's not just the upfront cost, but of course that we're trying to bring down, but if the cost of being able to just get to work and to drive and over the lifetime of the vehicle, how much you are saving. If you've got, you know, if you fill up once or twice a, uh, a month, you are making a huge amount of savings for everyday citizens. And that's of course another big piece of it. All right, well, we're gonna keep the focus on you, Senator Granholm, and uh, a little bit of a spotlight on you. Another challenge, clearly, is EVs will increase demand for electricity in our communities. How are we preparing the electrical infrastructure for this increase in demand? So we've bought it, we're ready to go. How are we dealing with yeah, the Yeah, this is a really important question because, of course, charging does pull electricity 
But charging and having a battery in your vehicle also provides an opportunity to provide resiliency to the grid if you have bi-directional charging and you are providing energy to and taking energy from that battery. So these are virtual power plants. In fact, today there was a story about Google and Ford teaming up to create virtual power plant pilots. Utilities are super interested in making the grid more resilient by being able to pull power in times when it's necessary from all those thousands of EV batteries that are out there. So that's number one, is that it can be more resilient. We have to essentially, though, as we move to the, go the goal of getting to 100% clean electricity by 2035, which is the President's goal, in addition to net zero uh, e economy-wide by 2050, we've got to add about 2,000 gigawatts of energy to our electric grid. And so our, the bipartisan infrastructure law has really in, allowed us to invest in adding transmission and incentivizing new transmission lines. We want those transmission lines, of course, to be secure, to make sure that they are able to be hardy from cyber attacks, et cetera, but we have to increase the capacity. So on both fronts, using the vehicles to be able to make the grid more resilient is important, as well as adding additional renewable energy capacity onto the grid, because you don't want to charge your electric vehicle and then have that energy come from a carbon uh, pollution producing source. So we want to clean energy on the grid and that way everybody ends up, it's not everybody, but people who choose to drive electric ends up running uh, their car on sunshine. Um, the final thing I would say is that utilities are super interested in this in another way as well. There's a pilot that was just announced, Rocky Mountain Power Utility, um, and they uh, did a partnership with a company that is a rideshare company, and I think utilities are going to see this opportunity to be able to have access to the batteries through fleets of rideshare vehicles and then be able to monetize that investment as well when they are not pulling electricity from those batteries. So it's uh, you know, potentially a great moneymaker for utilities that are looking at this as well. All right. Well, uh, Secretary Buttigieg, I've had the honor and pleasure to manage agencies that build roads, they're truly multimodal, uh, but public transportation is near and dear to my heart. What are we doing to ensure that our systems and as we deploy these new technologies, what are we doing to ensure that other than automobiles, how can we get to zero emissions, particularly as it relates to public transportation alternative modes? A great question. As enthusiastic as we are about the electric vehicle conversion, that's not all there is to the story of decarbonizing transportation. And a huge part of how we get this done is through public transportation in two ways. First, to make public transportation itself move in the direction of zero emissions. And that's one of the reasons why one of the extremely exciting major investments in the president's infrastructure package is the low and no uh, emission bus vision. Uh, literally putting our money where our mouth is so that instead of urging or pressuring transit authorities to buy these zero emission buses, for example, we're funding them to do that. And that brings uh, ultimately taxpayer savings, it brings cleaner air, uh, and uh, of course it brings us further along the way toward the climate solutions we need. The other thing worth mentioning, of course, is even as we make uh, individual cars and buses and other forms of transit uh, move in the zero emission direction, it's also just true pound for pound. There is always a huge climate benefit, and I would add uh, a safety benefit, to ensuring that people have access to excellent public transit. Uh, it is about mode shifting through creating great choices for people. And that means making, it's one of the reasons. Some applause. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know I'm preaching to the choir on this. Um, but here too, we're putting where, our money where our mouth is. Uh, this is oddly not getting as much attention as the things we're so excited about on bridges or EVs or the rest of it. But the infrastructure package, the president's infrastructure vision contains the biggest investment in public transit at the federal level in the history of US transportation. And that, even if we weren't aggressively working to decarbonize existing modes of transportation, that alone, I think, is one of the biggest and best things we can do from a climate perspective. Thank you. So, yeah. 
similar, similar to Nat, you know, my department is called the Department of Transportation and Development. It's a multimodal agency. Um, the last question I have for you has to do with preparing to really deliver this. So talk to me a little bit about, or talk to them about um, what are we doing to address supply chain as it relates to uh, EVs and batteries, and how are we going to address the workforce gap, what challenges we might see in this space to deal with that? Secretary Pete. Sure, uh, and I know Secretary Granholm will speak to an extra some extraordinary work going on on the supply chain side, so I'll, I'll uh, um, defer to her, especially with regard to, to the EV supply chain. But what I'll say is we know that what we're seeking to do here is of such proportions that it is testing the productive capacity of the U.S. economy. Uh, we are going to need so much, in, not just in terms of steel and concrete, but in terms of every form of talent from engineering to, to uh, bricklaying. And what that means is we have to call everybody into this, which is something we've been needing to do anyway, especially when I think about the, the, the many, many good paying jobs available, by the way, often whether you have a college degree or not, that come with actually doing this delivery. So from a perspective of equity and justice, but also just from a perspective of getting this done, we cannot afford to leave any talent on the table in this generation of construction uh, and development. And now that we are, you know, we, we spent our first year here selling this package, our second year standing it up, now it's year three, now we're out there doing, well, you all are out there doing it. And we need to be with you every step of the way on everything from getting out of our own way, if there are federal processes that could be smarter, to being at your side in supporting the workforce development, uh, the availability of everything from materials to technology to guidance that it's going to take to actually deliver this, because delivery is going to be no small thing. Secretary Granholm. Yeah, thanks so much for the question, because I think the economic development component is so important as we consider this, these new sectors, if you will. Um, so uh, I mentioned how many battery companies, including supply chain companies, had come, but I didn't talk about the fact that we are incentivizing that the Department of Energy um, ways to solve some of these problems by funding through grants companies that are solving. So yesterday, for example, our ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy, announced 12 com that we were funding 12 companies that were startups uh, to who were solving the problem of how not to degrade the battery for an electric vehicle with a fast charge. That's been uh, an issue, and we want to put all these fast chargers all across the country. How do we make sure? So 12 companies working on it across the country. At uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which provided the Department of Energy with a whole slew of grant money for communities to develop some of these solutions. So for example, hydrogen hubs, so hydrogen transportation hubs, we are going to be incentivizing the funding to go and evaluating proposals based upon whether they are being located in a disadvantaged community, an overburdened community. What we really want to do, uh, it's 20% of the proposals are being evaluated that way. And then the Inflation Reduction Act also incentivizes companies to locate their manufacturing of these clean energy supply chains in communities that have been left behind, have been at the back of the line. So there's, so for example, if you are going to manufacture uh, an electric vehicle battery, you get a 30% tax credit. If you locate that factory in a disadvantaged community, you get another adder, maybe another 10, could be as much as 20%. If you use a prevailing wage to build the factory, that's another 10%. If you use apprenticeships in there, so you could get as much as a 60% federal tax credit for locating in communities that have been left behind. So from an economic development, from a real perspective, this drives investment to places where we know need it most. And that means maybe it's a, a 
fossil community where they have seen jobs lost. Maybe it is a rural community that has been left behind. Maybe it is an urban community that has been disproportionately negatively affected by, car by pollution as a result of uh, you know, CO2 emissions. So the bottom line is the exciting part of these two bills is that they attempt to structurally correct some of the structural inequities that have existed. And for economic development agencies, the fact that the president is committed to 40% of the funding to go to communities that are overburdened or at the back of the line, that's just, it's the Justice 40 initiative. I think there is a real opportunity to lift all communities in these two bills. Well, before I hand it over to Nat, I'll just say that um, congratulations on leveraging these policy issues across the board because we're seeing it in the discretionary programs and the formula programs and your programs and in the joint effort and that is going to make this sustainable when you create that and so kudos to you and the thinkers behind that concept in the bipartisan infrastructure law back to you Nat all right well uh, thank you Sean and thank you Senator Granholm Senator uh, uh, Secretary Granholm Secretary uh, Buttigieg, uh, insightful and thoughtful conversation and discussion we have here uh, had. And uh, I just want to say we really are fortunate uh, that we have you at the helm in terms of all of these transportation and energy initiatives, uh, providing that guidance and providing, I think, a bold agenda for all of us to step up to the plate and deliver. And so on behalf of TRB and all of the members in this audience, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to spend time with us today and just share your vision and, and, and again, give us a little bit more uh, lift be wing, under our wings. And so thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much.